Hello, I am David Owen, Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I welcome you to the 2021 Phi Beta Kappa Lecture, sponsored by the University of Louisville's College of Arts and Sciences and the Phi Beta Kappa Association of Kentuckiana. The College of Arts and Sciences has hosted a Phi Beta Kappa Lecture each year since 2006. These lectures by nationally prominent scholars and leaders have all shared a commitment to the ideals of the Phi Beta Kappa Society, whose motto is, love of learning is the guide to life. The Phi Beta Kappa Society is committed to an education that fosters scientific inquiry, liberty of conscience, critical thinking, and creative endeavors, the very same values that are at the core of our College of Arts and Sciences. Now, I have the honor of introducing our university president, who is also the 2019 Phi Beta Kappa speaker, Dr. Neely Bendapudi. Dr. Bendapudi was selected as the 18th, 18th president of the University of Louisville in April of 2018. As both the first woman and the first person of color to be named president of the University of Louisville, Dr. Bendapudi has energized the campus community, reminded us of our noble purpose, and placed a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at the center of all we do. Under her bold leadership, the University of Louisville is making great strides towards becoming a great place for students to learn, a great place for employees to work, and a great place for alum, the alumni and the community to invest. Dr. Bendabudi, welcome. Thank you so much, Dino, and I appreciate those very, very kind words. And now everybody, it is truly my honor to introduce our Phi Beta Kappa uh, lecture uh, tonight the title is From A Plus to F, How the Liberal Arts Led Me to Congress and Also Changed the World. Love the title and I can't wait to hear more. And as you might have guessed, yes, we have a congressman here to speak to us and it's Chairman John Yarmuth, uh, who represents Kentucky's third congressional district in the US House of Representatives. Now in his eighth term, he has ch served as Chairman of the House Budget Committee since 2019. Chairman Yarmouth has been recognized for his work to improve education, expand access to affordable healthcare, and to revitalize manufacturing here in Louisville. Born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, Yarmouth graduated from Atherton High School and Yale University. And I want to tell you that Congressman Yarmouth, two things about him that you may or may not find in his bio. One is that when it came to the university that truly is part of his heart, he decided that we would be the repository for his papers and not some other university that may have been mentioned. So we are very, very grateful for that trust and we are eager to work with him. And then uh, he holds many titles including being a professor for us at the University of Louisville. Our students have the great honor from actually learning from Congressman Yarmouth. But I dare say that probably the title that's at the top of the many honors he's received is grandpa to JD. So I wanted to say that to personalize this incredible individual and friend to me, friend to the university. So, Chairman Yarmuth, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Neely, and uh, thanks to all of you for the great honor of uh, inviting me to uh, present this lecture. It was uh, scheduled to be done a year ago, and uh, I guess all things take time, but uh, I never expected it to take this long, and I never thought that we would be doing it still virtually uh, a year after uh, the pandemic started. But that's, that's what it is, and we're all getting used to it now. And uh, I will say that uh, the experience I've had teaching with Jasmine Ferrier in political science uh, course on Congress it, it has been one of the great experiences of my life, and uh, I hope to continue doing it. Uh, I love working with young people, and I'm so impressed with the caliber of the students uh, in those classes, and uh, I'll leave it at that. So here we go. Uh, a little more than a year ago, a woman named Betty Miles passed away. There was a brief obituary in the local paper 
but nothing in it could have adequately reflected the lives she touched. For me, she was answered the answer to the question, which teacher had the greatest impact on your life? Betty Miles was my English teacher. For all three years, I went to Atherton High School. She made me a much better writer. I'm sure we studied a great deal of literature in that class, but I remember what I remember so vividly today is a paper that was returned with a grade of A plus and her comment that she was so proud of the improvement I had made in my writing. I didn't think all that much about it at the time. And even when I was exempted from freshman English at Yale based on my writing sample, I still didn't connect the dots. From then until today, those dots form an unmistakable trail back to her Dundee Road classroom. The ability to communicate effectively both verbally and in writing has essentially determined my life's trail. And of course, it's why I'm here tonight. I was a lucky kid in many ways. I had a strong, smart, loving parents, a solid middle-class upbringing, and three siblings with whom I almost always got along. I was also to grow, lucky to grow up in an era in which we had to find our own intellectual and recreational outlets. Way before video games, way before the internet, and way before the Disney Channel. In fact, we had cartoon shows only on Saturday mornings and at lunch weekdays on Wave TV in the Magic Forest. Uh, for many Louisvillians, that's an inside story. My mo mother, who was brilliant at every age, when she had a precious few minutes, was always reading. My father too, in my earliest recollections, was a constant reader. So what was I to do when the cartoons, cartoons weren't on? I read. Without much on TV, we also listened to a lot of music. Broadway soundtracks were always on in my house. And I learned that music was not just Elvis and Frankie Avalon and, and, and Annette Funicello. Yeah, I'm showing my age, I understand that. Uh, music could blend with interesting storytelling and dancing and produce some incredibly exciting entertainment. Well, I was not always an effective writer as a young guy. I was a voracious reader. Like many kids way back then, my first book was The Little Engine That Could. As I got a little bit older, I devoured the Chip Hilton series. This was a, a series of books about a high school multi-sports star. It was thrilling to turn those pages and visualize the last second basket, the ninth inning homer, or the game winning touchdown pass. I read The Making of a President in 1960 by Theodore White, his trailblazing account of JFK's successful presidential campaign. At 15, I read one of the most provocative books I have ever read. It was called The Cardinal. And it was a story of a priest whose sister faced a pregnancy that would likely take her life and the agony that priest went through as he counseled her in accordance with his faith. It most likely began my interest in difficult moral political dilemmas, of which we have many. About the same time, I read Advise and Consent, a novel by Alan Drury about the confirmation process of a Secretary of State nominee to be, yeah, to be Secretary of State. And I was enthralled by Senate procedures and the way things could go very, very wrong. Those books and more I read because I wanted to, not because they were assigned to me in school. Like I said, I was lucky I had minimal options. So when I went off to Yale, I thought I wanted to focus on political science, but we had all sorts of requirements, foreign language, science, and the humanities. I hated that at the outset but I eventually realized how important it was, especially when I decided that there weren't enough political science courses that interested me. A brief aside, one of my freshman year courses was philosophy. And I remember sitting in a window seat in my dorm room, struggling with Aristotle, ultimately getting so frustrated that I threw the book out the window and dropped the course the next day. Why would anyone start an introductory philosophy course with Aristotle? I have no idea. Much later, and still today, I've said that if I were to go back and do my undergraduate education, I would major in philosophy, but I would still skip Aristotle. So once I decided I couldn't major in political science, I became a history major. And when I couldn't find enough interesting history courses, I became an English major. And then I was a junior, 
and the only major I could pick that I could complete in four years was American Studies, which was the ultimate liberal arts major. Also a great major for playing Jeopardy. Once again, how lucky I was. I took American art history, American literature, economics, sociology, in addition to poli sci and history, and they all counted toward my major. In my last year, we had a senior seminar, and while I can't remember the subject of the seminar, if there even was one, the purpose of the seminar was to produce a senior thesis that embodied multiple disciplines focused on an American topic. I decided to do mine on speculation in the 1920s. It comprised a wondrous blend of economics, politics, sociology, psychology, music, flappers, of course, all through historical lens. What an incredible example of how, of how so many liberal arts subjects not just came together, but imposed themselves on an important event, event in our country's development. It was the most academic fun I had at Yale and the best ac academic work I ever did. After graduating from Yale, I spent a lost year as a stockbroker. Not that there's anything wrong with being a stockbroker, but it wasn't something that interested me. And it did not let me employ any of the liberal arts education I, received, I had received. So when U.S. Senator Marlo Cook invited me to join his staff in Washington, I leaped at the chance. And here's where things started to get interesting. My first week in D.C. was in February 1971. President Richard Nixon had just introduced an innovative program called Revenue Sharing, which was a program to give discretionary federal funding to the states. Cook asked me to write a floor speech for him on the, that Nixon initiative. I had not written a speech since I had run for student council president in 1964, uh, but I did my best. I was on the floor for the speech, and afterward, Illinois Senator Chuck Percy came over to my boss and asked, did you get a new speechwriter? That was very impressive. Aside from the pride I felt and the realization that maybe I was a decent writer, I had quickly become Cook's primary writer. What did that mean? That I had to write about the economy and coal and farming and foreign policy and virtually every subject under the sun. So every day I used the same research and library skills I had acquired while writing my thesis. The liberal arts had struck again. It also meant that I had to think about my next career steps when I or my boss left the Senate. Turned out he had lost the next race and I began to pursue an idea I had, which was to replicate the Washingtonian magazine, which I had read regularly while I was in DC. Eventually, I founded Louisville Today magazine in 1976, and I spent the next five years editing and writing the monthly. I wrote about art, politics, business, gasoline. I was particularly proud of that one. And I edited articles on fashion and music and education. And when I had to shut the magazine down in 1981, I ended up at the University of Louisville in charge of all external communications programs. What an experience that was. One day I would focus on athletics, next day on fine arts, next day on some scientific development or medicine or engineering or history. And I was in charge of WUOL, the then university owned classical music station. And I enhanced my knowledge of that genre. In short, I got a second education on the job training in the liberal arts. When I left U of L, I got another opportunity to employ my growing liberal arts background. Our local cable system hired me to do a weekly public affairs talk show. And for eight years, I talked to people from all walks of life. It definitely was not all about politics. Every week, it seemed like I was preparing for a different topic. And there never was a topic that didn't demand a liberal arts foundation in order for me to ask relevant and intelligent questions of the guests. During that time, I also founded the Louisville Eccentric Observer, the alternative newspaper that is still alive in its 31st year, and it is owned and directed by my son, Aaron. For 15 years, I wrote weekly columns, and as you would immediately surmise, my entire life before that is reflected in those writings, as well as in the publication itself. The point of all this reflection is not just to show how the liberal arts have not only infused, but essentially directed my career paths. My intent is to show the evolution of the candidate I presented to the people of the third district in 2006. 
I was the embodiment of a liberal arts education, reinforced by certain presentation skills that I honed through many public appearances, TV and otherwise. Because even though I had no formal public speaking instruction, another liberal art, I am sure my ability to communicate effectively to audiences large and small was an important element of my electoral success that year and since then. So that was my road to Congress. From that A plus, and I should confess that was the only one I remember getting, to the F, which is the failing grade I get every year from the NRA, the National Rifle Association, for my gun voting record, and which I proudly display every year. And now in my 15th year in the House, I can say without hesitation or fear of contradiction that without the liberal arts, I might still be toiling away in that stockbroker job or something equally unsatisfying. Fortunately, the stars aligned in a more favorable direction. And now well into my congressional career, I clearly understand how important a grounding in the liberal arts is to doing my job well. How could you intelligently discuss race without an understanding of history, religion, geography, economics, politics, even music and biology? How can you responsibly meet our healthcare challenges without having some exposure to ethics, in addition to economics, politics, sociology, and biology? You couldn't possibly understand the Middle East without economics, religion, history, politics, and geography. Take almost any issue before Congress, and the liberal arts are essential to an understanding of the complexities that need to be resolved. Believe me, I can tell within a few sentence, sentences of another member's arguments if they have a liberal arts background or something much more narrow. I'm asked frequently by students about what they should do if they want to prepare for a career in politics. I consistently and passionately advise them to take the broadest possible liberal arts curriculum. And I explain to them that they need to be prepared for a wide range of issues and the liberal arts are the only way to do that. By the way, I also give that advice to anyone who wants to be a journalist. I say, don't go to journalism school. Focus on all the subjects you might be required to report on and write about. And yes, I realize uh, I, just under, I just ended a sentence uh, with a prep preposition. I apologize for that. And one almost final thought. As chairman of the budget committee, I'm often called on to defend expenditures of one kind or another. Two of the frequent targets of federal spending are the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Aside from the economic arguments I make that the arts and humanities are economic engines that uh, across our country employ millions of Americans, I make a more spiritual and crucial point. The only things that have survived throughout the history of civilizations are the creations of the human mind. Think about it, art, sculpture, literature, poetry, music, architecture survived for millennia. Blockbuster, Radio Shack, and Toys R Us are long gone. The liberal arts are the studies of what it means to be human, and ultimately, what is more important than that. As a matter of fact, maybe we should rename the liberal arts the human sciences. That might be a little more accurate. My father only spent a year or two in college. And his view of education, sadly but understandably, was that if you couldn't make money from your education, it was a waste of time. He would always respond to my poor selections by saying, how are you going to make money from that? Usually I didn't have an answer. Today, I would. And actually, in today's fast-changing world, with the unimaginable impact of artificial intelligence and other technologies that faces us, I could logically claim that finally, philosophy majors are going to be in high demand. Their time has come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Congressman uh, Yarmouth has uh, kindly agreed to answer some questions. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, You'll see that there are uh, there's a Q and A icon where you can um, where you can write your question. We have one already. As chair of the budget committee, what can be done about the large percentage of funding that goes to defense? 
here's a question that's going to draw on your liberal arts education. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, a wonderful question. A uh, little background. So the, uh, the Congress has on an annual basis uh, what we call discretion to over about 30% of the entire federal budget. 70% of the budget is what's called mandatory spending. That's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the interest on the debt, and a few other programs. Uh, so we, the only way we control that is if we change the conditions of the programs. The other 30%, which is everything else the government does, has uh, defense and then not what we call non-defense discretionary spending. Of that, it, roughly today, it's about $1.4 trillion a year. Defense is 700, roughly 750 billion of that, so slightly more than half. Um, there, are, there are many of us who understand that, you know, the, the reality that we spend more on defense than the next eight or 10 largest defense spending countries in the world. So take China and Russia and you know, the next eight or so, and we spend more than that. Um, we, the, the political problem with cutting the defense budget is that so much of it involves uh, weapon systems and other equipment systems that have subcontractors in virtually every congressional district. I think this was done deliberately to create a political constituency for continuing funding, uh, but we really do need as a country to figure out how to break through that. Uh, we have a uh, uh, one project, the, the uh, F-35 fighter jet that has been in the works for at least 15 years now, uh, which, for which we have spent uh, in the tens of billions of dollars and we don't have a viable aircraft yet. But that aircraft has, again, has subcontractors in virtually every con congressional district. So it's a real tough political issue. Um, I think at some point we just have to say we're going to give the Defense Department uh, a certain amount of money and you have to live with it and you decide what to cut. We did that a few years ago with the BRAC system where we said you've got too many bases, we're going to set up a BRAC commission, they're going to decide which bases survive and which don't. Um, but again, these are incredibly difficult uh, political problems and we haven't been able to do much about it. So this year, uh, President Biden has proposed um, about a one and a half percent increase in, in the defense budget. That's basically to provide raises for our, our soldiers and airmen and women and uh, sailors and so forth, uh, and very little for other, kind of other operations. But we've got a long way to go. Again, $750 billion. Uh, and if you take everything else the government does, and that's so that's housing, infrastructure, uh, education, healthcare, well, not healthcare, because that's the other, um, veterans, veterans affairs, um, and veteran programs, you name it, everything else we do, the FBI, IRS, every agency, that's all less than the federal budget. And, uh, you know, there, there's been a great recognition, even in the, on the part of military, of the military, that we have, that one, for instance, one of the biggest threats we have to national security right now is climate change. That's, that's a Pentagon conclusion, not, uh, not Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's conclusion. That's the Pentagon's conclusion. And yeah, I think you remember when Je uh, Admiral Mullen said, if, if, uh, if you decrease the di diplomatic budget, you're going to have to uh, buy me more bullets. So there's a great recognition that we're spending too much. We're not spending it efficiently. I mean, I don't know why in the world we're, we're buying tank, we're building tanks now. Uh, most of our, our most serious threats right now come from cybersecurity, for instance, and, and not from uh, physical or military attack. So uh, it's gonna take a lot, a lot of political courage to do that. So far, we haven't been able to muster that much. Bad answer, but that's reality. So a question that takes us back around to the, um, the academics with which you began, is there a subject area in the liberal arts that you did not study, that you regretted not studying, that would have come in handy later? 
Well, like I said, I never really did end up studying philosophy because I dropped the course. And you know, when, when years ago, um, for a number of years, I would, when I was in journalism, I would go to U of L and speak to an ethics course. Uh, and that, and the ethics course was housed in the philosophy, philosophy department. And that was something that actually kind of surprised me, but made total sense. And uh, that's something that, uh, again, if I were if I were to go back to college, I would major in philosophy because I think it it permeates virtually everything we do. And when you're sitting in Congress and making policy choices, there are very few that don't involve involve ethical considerations. And again, that's that's going to that's going to increase as as we go forward. So, um, yeah, that's the one I wish I'd spent more time at. I think you've just made our uh, dean very happy, as he is a philosopher. <laughs> um, back to politics. Much has been written about the um, increased polarization in U.S. politics. What do you think are the main reasons for this? So there are a number of reasons. Uh, the, there, one of the reasons is, is money in politics. Um, one of the reasons is that politics, for some unknown reason, and I, I'm still trying to deal with this, is that political affiliation has become part of people's identity much more than it ever was before. And you know, when I was growing up, my dad was a Republican. I was, I was a Republican initially. Um, I was a Republican until 1985. And, but when I, when I was a staffer on Capitol Hill, um, back in the 70s, there, we were always working across the aisle because there were liberals and conservatives in both parties. Uh, there was, um, you know, in the, in the Democratic Party, some of these names won't mean a lot to some people, but in the Democratic Party, you had um, Ted Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey and Fritz Mondale, who just died, and uh, a lot of liberals. And then you had people like uh, um, uh, Russell Long from Louisiana and James Sparkman from Alabama and Richard Russell from Georgia, who were some of the biggest racist, most conservative uh, people in the country. On the Republican side, you had conservatives like Jesse Helms and Barry Goldwater and um, uh, Strom Thurmond, but you also had Jacob Javits and Ed Brooke from Massachusetts and Mark Hetfield from Oregon uh, and Bob Packwood from Oregon. So you, you were always working across the, the party line because there was always somebody who agreed with you. And the other thing was, you did not have the external influences that you have now and, and the communications, the 24 seven communication system. So you, you, had, you didn't have the constant pressures to, uh, against compromising or against, against negotiating with person, somebody from the other party. Uh, and you, you, could, you could do that, you could make those uh, compromises and deal because you weren't under intense scrutiny that doesn't exist today so right now people are afraid of, afraid of their own shadows if they even talk to somebody from the other party they're they're, they're threatened with a, a primary challenge so um just again it's, it's mostly the outside world that has pulled us apart um, i was in 2013 i was part of what was called the gang of eight um, and it was eight members, four Republicans, four Democrats, who spent seven months working on immigration reform. And we, we negotiated in those, we met every day to, while we were in session. And we negotiated like normal human beings would negotiate. We'd say, well, if I give up on this, well, you know, what are you going to give me that I want? And if, if you can't sell this this way, what if we did it this way? And yeah, yeah, I might be able to sell that. And, and it was a really refreshing exercise. The reason we were able to do it was because we did it in secret. And that's, you know, we don't, we don't want a government that operates in secret, but that's kind of the reality we face. And I, I read today where there's a, there's a group working on police reform and they, they basically said, they're doing it behind closed doors. They're not talking about what they're doing because they're trying to find a, a middle ground. So, it's, you know, it's a, identity politics has made, poli made politics a, a spectator sport. It's blue jerseys, red jerseys, it's UK, U of L. And you know, the country, to a certain extent, has sorted itself by, um, by political affiliation. 
And the crazy thing is it really doesn't relate to policy that much. The, the American people on almost every issue are overwhelmingly on one side or the other, and yet um, they, don't, they don't vote that way, and they don't necessarily analyze issues that way. It's almost like if I was for a certain policy under Donald Trump, now that Joe Biden is for it, I'm against it. We saw that, we saw that a lot with, with Obama. Uh, it, back in, in uh, you know, the, the idea of cap and trade, which is a, a way, a free market approach to dealing with pollution, uh, was a Republican idea in the late 70s and 80s. And uh, Mitch McConnell voted for uh, cap and trade when George Herbert Walker Bush proposed it to deal with sulfuric acid rain. When Obama proposed that same concept to deal with carbon emissions, it all of a sudden became tax and trade and uh, the Republicans were all against it. And it's, been, it's worked both ways. So we're, you know, we're, we're in a dysfunctional political world right now. And um, it's, it's very sad and it's, it's, it makes Congress look, dis look dysfunctional, which we largely are. But um, you know, people got to chill out and worry about other things rather than politics and, and say, OK, just let the politicians alone do it or realize that uh, everybody with a blue, shirt, blue jersey on is not always right and everybody with a red jersey on is not always wrong. And we're not, we're a long way from that right now, unfortunately. So a question that combines philosophy and politics. Um, the questioner asks, uh, references Plato's Republic and in it the idea that those who actively seek positions of leadership, present company accepted, simply cannot be trusted to act for the common good. The questioner invites you to defend or refute the following statement. A truly democratic society will draft leaders from its ranks. The more reluctant, the better. Well, in this world, that is, um, that might be a, um, a kind of a unicorn, but, and it might make some sense, but in this world today, Strangely enough, most people don't spend all of their lives thinking about politics. The vast majority of people don't. And in a representative government, and Plato knew something about this, um, in a representative government, the idea is you, you elect people and entrust them with making the decisions that uh, they think are best for you. And, and I still think that's the, be that's the right approach. Um, you know, sometimes the public does draft people into, into office. We see that uh, occasionally with members of Congress and, and in the House and Senate. Uh, but you know, I, I think you really want to have to, you, you really want to have, you, you have to want to do public service uh, to be effective. You have to be driven by, um, by that, uh, that urge and uh, there still are a lot of options to public service out there, and uh, there, there are a lot of people I know whom I would love to see in, in politics, but they don't have that, the urge to do it. And if they don't have the urge to do it, they, they're not going to be very good at it. So, you know, Plato might have been right for his time when there weren't a lot of job opportunities, but or at least a lot of different career options, but I don't think that's very viable today. All right. Um, and a question about higher education. Um, thank you for your support of higher ed and the liberal arts. Colleges and universities have become dependent on adjunct and contingent labor. These positions are often low paying with no benefits. The Sanders Jayapal College for All bill aims to reverse this, requiring 75% of appointments to be tenure track. What are your views on this proposal? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to defer to people who know more about it than I do. I, I, you know, I, um, and, and President Ben Dabuti and I have talked a little bit about this. You know, I think that the higher education is going to look a lot different 20, 25 years from now than it does today. Uh, it's going to have to evolve. And I'm not smart enough to know what that's going to look like or what it should look like. 
but um, you know, I, I do know that we, we need to figure out um, what education should look like. Again, I, you know, I, 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 clearly I'm a, a strong supporter of, of liberal arts, but uh, we've seen over the last year, just kind of technologically, how things can change and what the future, part of the future might look like. And with that comes so many more options for faculty, um, means of instruction. Um, so again, I'm not an expert in it. All I know is that right now, uh, with the world changing as rapidly as it is now and is going to, it's going to change at a much more rapid pace. That we need to we need to prepare people for um, a we need to give people basic skills and um, foundation of of knowledge so they can deal with the changes. I, I, I've said I say to people all the time. I said it to my class the other day. The number one ability. For anybody moving forward, anybody who's in school now, a young adult is adaptability. That's what you're going to have to have. And uh, you know, I, I wonder whether teaching, for instance, teaching knowledge now makes any sense because uh, the statistics on this are crazy. Uh, I'll throw out some trivia. Uh, Google has uh, indexed four percent of the world's knowledge. How bizarre is that? Four percent of the world's knowledge. It's estimated now that the, the store of knowledge in the world changes, double, I'm sorry, doubles every 13 months. By 2035, they estimate store of knowledge in the world will double every 12 minutes. So thinking about that kind of, of world and world of knowledge, you have to wonder what what role colleges play in, in the, the world. Colleges are going to have to play the world of people, you know, critical thinking, how to assimilate information, how to vet information, how to apply information. And I, I don't know how to do that. I'm not an educator, uh, even though I play one uh, a couple times a week these days. But um, I, I'd leave that to the experts and Neely and so many of them are on this, this program. So. You have Good begun to answer uh, the Dean's question. Um, Congressman Yarmouth makes a compelling case for the value of a liberal arts education, but how do we change the public narrative about this when the trend has been increasingly toward vocational pathways rather than the liberal arts? Yeah. Um, you know, this is a situation, again, it, it kind of goes back to my father. And, you know, I, I Part of it, I think, is um, that the cost, the cost has a lot, and the financing have a lot to do with this. I, I think that, that since that becomes, you do, since it's a huge investment, and you know, whether you're borrowing it or you have the money, and 75% you know, of people or more have to borrow the money to go to college, you're making a huge, huge investment, and you're, you're thinking about how do I get a return on that investment, so you're, you're orientation is going to be much more pragmatic and those who make policy decisions are going to think the same way. Um, so changing the, the metric of financing the, the college education, whether it's free college for all, I don't know if we can do that, free public education for all, it'd be great if, if we could do that. Um, I think that would change, change the dynamic uh, appreciably when people say, okay, I'm free to learn whatever I want to learn. I don't have to worry about it my return on investment and you know so that that would be my answer to, as to how we change the dynamic you know it's it's hard to change people's opinions these days i i was in a discussion um yesterday morning with our the, all the chairmen and and we were talking about messaging and i said you know there are only two things about messaging to me, as far as I'm concerned, there are only two factors in messaging in politics. One is, um, what do we say to move people toward us? And what do we say to keep people from abandoning us? All the rest is noise. So we can talk about these grandiose themes like democracy and freedom and we're all for the people and all this nonsense. 
Uh, but politically, it doesn't make any difference. And you know, I, th I think educators, certainly in the liberal arts, need to think of uh, that, think through that perspective. What do we say to people who um, you know, would, would maybe are gonna go into engineering or they're gonna go into business um, and say, okay, but your job may not be there in five years. The job you think you're training for may not be there in five years. As a matter of fact, there's probably a 50-50 chance it won't be there. Uh, and all this kind of vocational training is um, is not a is probably not a long term sound investment, and you need to have the, the the critical thinking skills, the experience in the creative arena, the things that stoke your creative powers. Those are the things that are going to probably sustain you for um, throughout your your life. And again. You know, part of the part of the problem is getting people to listen to that. Part of the people is getting it, part of it's getting pe to people at the the high school level, the junior high school level. Even again, you're asking me to opine on a field that I'm not an expert in. Well, the next question is squarely in your wheelhouse. As budget committee chair, uh, what are the three or four things that you're most excited about getting accomplished? through the proposed infrastructure bill? Well, um, first of all, um, I will say that the, the last month or so has been the most um, exciting, rewarding month of my life in terms of professionally. Uh, the, the bill that we passed, the American Rescue Plan, which uh, we passed last month, which has my name on it, um, because under the process we used, all of that has to come through the budget committee. So my name was on as the, 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 the sponsor, and I managed the bill through the house two different times. Um, and the, the ability to have affected so many lives in a positive way was just overwhelming. And still, I'm, I'm blown away by what we were able to do. And I, and I, I, I talk to people all the time. I say, can you, can you imagine thinking back to November 4th of last year where we didn't know who the president was going to, that was the day after the election. We didn't know who the president was going to be. We didn't think we would take the Senate and we've lost our margin in the House. That was a few months ago. And here we are passing one of the largest bills to support the average uh, American that has ever been passed in this country. And, uh, so again, I don't want to rest on my laurels. I said our biggest problem right now is making sure we're not a one hit wonder. And so the, the infrastructure bill is our next opportunity to do something incredibly important. And to also expand the, the concept of what we consider infrastructure. And you know, the president has proposed uh, $400 billion for uh, childcare and elder care and because I've tried to explain it, uh, if you can't get to if you can't get to your job because you don't have the availability of, of affordable child care or uh, care for your uh, the the parent or grandparent you're taking care of, that's every bit as much infrastructure as if you can't get public transportation to your job. So we we do have to think about a 21st century concept of infrastructure as opposed to a 19th century view of infrastructure, which is, I'll, this is my partisan bell goes off, partisan alert. Uh, this is the way the Republicans are. If you're not roads and bridges and, and water systems, you're not infrastructure. Uh, that's not, that doesn't relate to uh, so many lives that, uh, in, in our society right now. So um, we're gonna get an infrastructure bill and it's gonna be a lot larger than what the Republicans want and that'll be good it'll be good for the country and you know i'm going to be right in the middle of that because we're going to probably end up doing it through the reconciliation process which is the way we end up having being able to pass something in the senate with uh, without getting 60 votes um so i'm looking forward to that and that process is starting we'll probably start in another month or so so uh and then 
uh, Biden's going to introduce his American Families Plan next week, which um, deals with all sorts of human capital investment. And that's going to be something that um, I look forward to working on, too. So we've got a lot of opportunities to, to, um, to change the way we think about government's role in, in our society. Over the, you know, I go back to Reagan years when you know, Reagan said government's not the answer, government's the problem. Uh, we've got a chance to reverse that and say government can be the answer. And certainly government at the federal level has a significant role to play in, in making lives better. And I, I, I and many of my colleagues had pretty much given up hope that we could ever do anything consequential to make significant improvement in people's lives. And, and uh, the fact that we were able to do that last month and uh, have opportunities to do more is very exciting. So you've, you've spoken of the importance of persuasion in, in politics. Um, can you say more about the importance of the liberal arts to civic engagement more broadly conceived? Oh. <laughs> well, we're, in a very, we're in a very difficult uh, era in terms of persuading people. And the, the primary reason we, we're in a different uh, era is that we, we don't get our information from the same sources. So uh, we are, at, you know, this is not an original thought by any means, but we're siloed in our information uh, uh, universes. And so we're, we, those of us on the progressive side, those of us who believe in things like the liberal arts and the humanities, uh, we're not talking to the people we need to convince, and they're not listening to us. So the, the key, I think, to ending this polarization, to, to ending this divided society, is to figure out a way to get people to listen to everyone. And uh, we're a long way from doing that. So I wish I had a better answer for the problem, but um, but I don't. Uh, I recognize the problem. We all do, and you know it, it's it's amazing how you know if I if I reflect on at any given time on the people I've talked to over the past six months or the past year, I generally can come up with um, one hand on one hand the number of people I talked to who didn't already agree with me. It's amazing how we have we have sorted ourselves into politically agreeable worlds. Uh, there's a guy named Bill Bishop who actually was from Kentucky, um, who, now who now lives in Austin, Texas, who wrote a book about 10 years ago called The Big Sort. It's a fascinating book. It was he was probably the first person to recognize how society is divided, dividing itself, where we live, where we pray, where we play, where we, all these things by political uh, affiliation. And, uh, he didn't have any good answers to that, but the trend has continued. And unt again, until we get, if we, until we get a, essentially an avenue to talk to those who, um, who don't agree with us, uh, I don't know how we persuade anybody of anything. So a very, uh, a wonky budget question. Could you elaborate? <laughs> You're ready <laughs> on what would be involved in a, in adjusting budgets for entitlements. Okay, so um, I have a very different view on uh, the need to to reform entitlements, but I will give you some thoughts. Uh, so first of all, let's let's take um, uh, Social Security. The the um, the stewards of Social Security say that starting in 2034, we will not be able to pay 100% of the promised benefits, that we will we'll be able to pay about 83%, something like that. Um, there's a very, very interesting and simplistic reason why that's the case. The law, the Social Security law says that all benefits paid out of, paid and under Social Security have to be paid from the trust fund. In other words, they can't be paid from the, from the treasury, the general fund. 
we could change that in a minute. We can change the law and say, we no longer have to pay the funds from the trust fund. Automatically, Social Security becomes solvent forever because it's being paid out of the general fund. <laughs> now, the problem with that is, then it becomes, Social Security benefits become subject to annual appropriations. So you're relying on Congress to vote every year to make those appropriations. I'm not afraid of that because I don't think anybody's gonna vote against Social Security <laughs> benefits, but that's one way we can do it. The other way we can do it is right now, Social, Social Security taxes come into the government, they go into the, they go into the general fund, and the general fund then issues, the treasury then issues treasury notes to the Social Security Trust Fund. We decide what the interest rate on those treasury notes is. Right now it's 2%. So all of the Social Security funds that are represented by US treasuries in the trust fund are paying 2% interest. We could raise that to 5% tomorrow. And that would automatically stabilize the Social Security Trust Fund. So the things we can do that uh, are pretty simple that don't involve cutting benefits or changing eligibility. I think next year the eligibility, the, the benefits start at 67. Uh, right now they're at 66. But uh, we don't need to do all that stuff. And last night we had, um, and I, I would recommend this book to anybody, there, a woman named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at University of Stony Brook, who used to be at the University of Kansas with Neely, uh, has written a book called The Deficit Myth. And she represents a school of thought, which is gaining a lot of adherence, including me, uh, called Modern Monetary Theory. And Modern Monetary Theory, to be as brief as possible, says, if you have a sovereign currency, which the United States does, so we we are the issuer of our, own, of our own currency. The country does not borrow money in any other currency. It does not spend in any other currency. That we can basically spend as much money as we need to, as we want to. Uh, the only constraint being that we can't put more money in the economy than the economy can absorb because then you get inflation. Uh, and if you hear people talk about fiscal space, uh, if you happen to be watching one of these wonky uh, programs, fiscal space is how much can they can again the, the federal government put into the economy without causing inflation. Uh, and most people, including the, the chairman of the Fed, Jay Powell, say we have plenty of fiscal space right now. We can spend this. We can do the infrastructure bill. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to raise taxes to do it, even though Biden wants to raise corporate taxes to do it. So, um, you know, one of the things with entitlements, we, we're still in the baby boom era. We have 10,000 people a day turning 65, so they're eligible for Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, the, the proposals now are to actually uh, reduce the age of Medicare eligibility to, to somewhere 50, 60 or, or 55, or maybe even 50, um, which I think is really worth considering because then you get healthier people in that system, which helps lower the cost overall healthcare, but on average. But anyway, there are all sorts of ways we can do this. The, the problem is that nobody really wants to touch them in a political way because they're so sensitive. Uh, and right now with a 50-50 split in the Senate, you know, we, have, we can lose right now in the House two votes. <laughs> if we don't get any Republican votes, we can only lose two votes in anything we try to do. So the environment partisan-wise is not, not right, but I think it will be at some point. And then we can really have an, a really thoughtful discussion about what we do with uh, the question, you use the word entitlements. We hate that word because they're not entitlements, they're actually uh, benefits that American citizens have paid for through their working life. Uh, they paid into Social Security, they paid into Medicare. So we, we we call them earned benefits and not entitlements, but they are, they do comprise one of the, or constitute one of the uh, biggest shares of the budget. And uh, they they continue to grow at a rate, ex those expenses at a rate higher than other parts of the budget. So we do have to be conscious of it, but there are, there are some really clever things we can do to, to solve um, the challenges of those programs. So we've, 
We have time for one more question, and it's a practical one, and it draws on your experience as a policymaker and on your um, investment in persuasion. As you know, those of us in higher ed need to make our case to state legislators pretty much every budget cycle. Um, what advice do you have for us on how to make the case for the importance of the liberal arts? Um, is this the Kentucky legislature you're worrying about? <laughs> In our case, it is. <laughs> um, good luck. <laughs> no, I mean, we seriously, I, I have no qualms about saying this. Uh, the Kentucky legislature is uh, the biggest collection of morons that you could possibly assemble in this state. And they, they are, um, they have no interest in governing. They have no interest in even thinking about things like higher education. All they want to do is maintain power. All they want to do is diminish the governor's power. All they want to do is end abortion. Uh, they have such a, a, uh, a narrow and short-sighted perspective on public policy, it is frightening. And as bad as I think congressional Republicans are, Kentucky Republicans in the General Assembly are the absolute worst. I, and, you know, I, I look at Georgia and I look at Texas and I look at some of these other states and I, I would rank our, our General Assembly as, uh, the, as retrogressive uh, um, as any of, any of the worst. So, I think it's hopeless right now, to be honest, with this General Assembly. Well, I unless you're talking about unless you're talking about UK basketball, it's fine. They'll fund that if they had to. Uh, but no, it's it's to me it's it's just the most discouraging. When I watched that session this year, it's, it was one of the most discouraging things that I've ever seen. And you know, I'm hope I'm very hopeful that. Um, without Donald Trump on the ballot, that 2022 will be better for Democrats. Not that all Democrats are, are saints either, but generally speaking right now, you know, Republicans just don't have any good ideas for governing. And that, that's at every level. And they're, they're not even trying, but um, you know, hopefully we can change and get people who understand primarily you know, it's always an investment in the future. We know how much more uh, college graduates generate, income they generate over a lifetime. We know as opposed to high school graduates or non-graduates. And the, the long-term uh, success of, of the Kentucky economy is gonna be depending, dependent on a well-educated, adaptable, creative, workforce. And you don't get that unless you invest in higher education and, and liberal arts, critical thinking, and all those things we've talked about tonight. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn things over to Paul Houck from the Phi Beta Kappa Association. Thank you, Susan. Um, on behalf of the Phi Beta Kappa Association of Kentuckiana, I want to thank Congressman Yarmouth for being our featured speaker for the 2021 Phi Beta Kappa Lecture. Uh, it's fair to say that we have certainly appreciated your candid thoughts and insights. I also want to thank President Neely Bendapudi and Dean David Owen and Dr. Susan Ryan and everyone who worked to bring this program together. Also, thank you to all who took the time to be with us tonight. Our Phi Beta Kappa Association has had the privilege for many years now to partner with the University of Louisville and the College of Arts and Sciences in co-sponsoring this lecture series, and we look forward to many years to come. And here's to hoping that next year we'll do this in person. If you would like to learn more about the Phi Beta Kappa Association of Kentuckiana, our activities, our programs, and efforts in support of the liberal arts and sciences, I invite you to visit our website at PBK 